to say welcome everyone and thank you for coming this uh, this day for our last guest talk in the lecture series around the amend exhibition curated by Jessica Walton in, um, in conjunction with the community book connection programming this year so um, before I turn the um, screen over to uh, Pamela, our artist who's talking today. I just need to say a, a brief thing um, from our Pathways coordinator, Becky Ocampo. So Becky wanted me to let you guys know that courtesy of the Arts Pathway, there will be a raffle for one card account credits. And as a reminder, with your one card, you can purchase items at the bookstore, the CCBC cafes, printing and most on-campus vending machines. Um, the drawings will be held after the conclusion of the artist talks and winners will be notified by email. So there's that. And then also one last reminder that registration is now open for winter and spring. So please make sure that you meet your advisor and register and make sure that you know your pathway. Um, so with that announcement done, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Pamela. Pamela, thank you for coming today. Well, thank you very much for having me as well. Um, I love that you're engaging in learning more about American Indian history. And so my work has really, um, does entail that. So I'm going to um, launch a PowerPoint presentation and you guys can all follow through and learn a little bit about my project, um, Legacy of Exile Indians. Okay. So first of all, um, I do want to acknowledge because I am a visitor here on the Tongva people's um, traditional homeland called Tavangar. And um, I want to just pay my respects to them, the ancestors, the past, and the relatives, relations, present and emerging. Yat eh she Pamela Peters in Chia, Tchachitni Nishlo, Tleshti Bashishchen, Tohutlini de Shiche, Ado Kitlishini de Chanolik, with Agonazahishle. Good day. Uh, my name is Pamela Peters. I just introduced myself um, with my traditional Navajo clans. Um, my main clan is the Tachini, which is the Water Flows Together clan. And I use that actually to identify my photography work as well. Um, I say my clans my, um, in my language because it, it, it humbles me and it reminds me of my ancestors and the blood that was sacrificed for me to be here today. So I say it in a very humble way. So I am just going to give a very brief overview um, about what I've encountered as an artist. Um, Native American art and storytelling is a way I feel like can correct the historical and contemporary misrepresentation of who we are as Native people. Not many people around the world today know that there are over 563 U.S. federally recognized tribes and more than 100 tribal nations that are not federally recognized but may be considered state recognized or in the process of being federally recognized today. In addition, there are over 140 Native American languages actively spoken today. So with that being said, my multimedia projects and the people that I work with is a small, small portion of that. Um, I also, uh, I use photography and I also wanted to share that I also use video and I do poetry. And I do that because I want to share the vast differences and like I said, in a small portion of stories that we can share as Native Americans here in North America. So, um, as a storyteller, uh, photographer and a producer, I illustrate narratives that provide real stories of American Indian life, both on tribal reservations and within urban establishments. My creativity and narrative started with the realization that of all the diversity stories and histories told about Native American Angelinos, virtually none had been focusing on American Indians living in Los Angeles today. So I wanted to change that and I wanted to provide stories that offer history, realistic images and narratives of American Indians in filmmaking, photography, and provide a indigenous voice, especially here in the Mecca of Hollywood filmmaking that has profusely damaged the image, the history and the voices of Indians today. So my first project was inspired by a film I saw in 2007 called The Exiles. 
It was a film that was produced and released in 1961 by a U.S. film student named Kent McKenzie. The film is considered a American, an American neorealism film that showcases a true depiction of American Indians, the real Indians living in Los Angeles at a time when Hollywood cinema was generating stereotypes of American Indians in Western film genre. I loved this film because it gave a realistic portrayal of American Indians going through the U.S. Indian Relocation Program. But most importantly, I loved it because it provided a multidimensional representation of characters ever seen, especially at that time in 1960, during the 1950s and 1960s. And it also provided a glimpse into the gentrification that was happening in downtown Los Angeles, which is now called the historical core of downtown Los Angeles today. The movie had a huge impact on me because it re represented a realistic narrative of American Indians living in Los Angeles during the 1950s and 60s, one that I had never rarely seen before. I also want to share that when I was studying film and television at UCLA, at that time I got extremely overwhelmed by what I was seeing in Western genre films. For me, to be invited to the um, restoration of the film, because UCLA did the restoration of the film back in 2007, I was able to see the film and it really changed the impact of my ability to want to become a storyteller. Um, the Exiles was a unique type of filmmaking, a new American style of filmmaking, as most filmmakers were drawn towards the traditional types of Hollywood cinema, which at that time was either Westerns or classic dramas that consist of high studio lot, um, the studio system, blitz and glamour, high budget, high budget um, stage settings with pretentious narratives that follow the success of middle and upper class society. Instead, McKinsey was drawn to the art of the new wave cinema, also known as neorealism, that was generated from European filmmakers in the 1950s and the 60s post the Second World War II. Post the Second World War, War sorry. The new form of filmmaking was also told in a non-fictional way, featuring reenactments of actual events that took place among the poor and working class. The actors were people of the community and the storylines were drawn from issues they face. They, it was their narratives. Um, they were filmed on location, giving voice to the underrepresented society, the community. And that's one of the re main reasons I really love The Exiles. So McKinsey, an English film student, was working on a project called Bunker Hill in 1956. It was a short film about the displacement of residents of a once vibrant urban community. Due to the city's planning for business development, while he was filming, he became friends with quite a few American Indians in that neighborhood. He was also familiar with the Indian Relocation Act of 1956. Knowing that he had to shed light on Native American issues, McKinsey made the conscious decision to give voice to American Indians he encountered in Los Angeles in, during that time. Oops, sorry. So the U.S. Indian Relocation Program was set up to lure young adults who were jobless after completing their education, which was, which was mostly considered a vocational tra training rather than what we have today as academic education. And most of these young adults were coming out of the boarding school system. They were further enticed by offering to pay moving expenses and more vocational training for those that were willing to move off the reservation to certain government designed cities, such as Los Angeles. The, fly the flyers, as you can see, were very appealing, promising a path of what many believe was an American dream. Although the program was established to provide this illusionary better life for American Indians, it was also had deceitful intentions. The, the program, the relocation program by the United States government had three main goals. First, it wanted to decrease subsidies given to in Indians living on reservations, even though those subsidies were granted in exchange for land seeding during treaty negotiations. Secondly, the policy wanted to deceitfully take land that had rich resources for the purpose of capital and community expansion. 
And thirdly, the BIA wanted American Indians to join the workforce for the expansion of urban development. However, what resulted was fierce competition between Indians and immigrants for blue collar jobs at that time. So the next um, screen, I'm gonna show you a quick brief preview of stories that were documented for a documentary on PBS. Can you guys hear it? No. Uh oh. oh. Yeah, for some reason it's not working right now. Let's see. I'm trying to think. I knew this was going to happen. Yeah, we even tested it yesterday. Uh. Please. Uh. Was to really can you hear it now? Now we can, yeah. Sorry about that. It's okay. The government thought one way to solve the Indian problem was to relocate Indians from the reservation to the bigger cities. They couldn't kill the Indians anymore. That was out of fashion by the 50s. Uh, so they decided to experiment. They did a lot of experimenting with Indians. Relocation program was one such experiment. It was exciting, relocation. You know, you get to go to a big city and they'll help you find a job and uh, you'll get to, you know, see the rest of the country. Of course, you weren't forced to go on relocation, but they made it look good. Streets paved with gold. We ended up in Cleveland, Ohio. Over 100,000 Indians were relocated in just 15 years. The government promised to help them find schools, housing, and employment. But for many, the promise rang hollow. They put us in a real dumpy motel. And I was just sitting there thinking, I wonder what's going on at home. I could just see the rolling hills and the small, small town. They're all just moving and walking and going real fast. And nobody's stopping to look around. That's why we stayed in our apartments or stayed in our rooms. If you went and uh, applied for a job, you better not tell them you're Indian. You better tell them you're French or you're some Italian or some other nationality. You, you wouldn't get the job. By the 1970s, half of all Indians lived in cities, and more than 100 tribes had ceased to legally exist. Sorry. So, based on the appealing claims made by the program, many Indians began to assimilate and run, assimilate into urban work and workforce. Most Indians that migrated into cities were young 20 something single Indians or young married couples. My parents, like many Indian families, migrated to the city through this program. Yet many people today do not know about the immigration of American Indians to metropolitan cities, nor about the US policy of assimilating through programs that entice young natives to leave their reservation homeland in hopes they would never return. So I am going to show, um, I don't think I'm gonna show the clip here. So this is my clip of my work in my response to what Kim, Kim, Kim McKenzie did with his film, The Exiles. Um, the, the film is actually available online if you wanna go out and um, research it. It's mostly available in most libraries at universities. But this, um, I did a continuation of what Kim McKenzie did about telling the story of relocation. Um, I did a reenactment of his film and some of my photography work, which you'll later see in my presentation. But this is a short clip I did of, in response to talking about relocation and talking about the imagery of American Indians and also sharing and giving um, the voice of young adults who, if 20 years, you know, 50 years from now, would have been in the same position of migrating to cities. So here's the video. 
Hello, my name is Courtney Alex. My name is Farius Tashreen Gladys DeCam, but everybody calls me Gladys for short. My name is Spencer Batiste. My name is Henry Singer. I'm Hopka, my name is Kenneth Ramos. I'm Daganio, I grew up on the Burma Indian Reservation in San Diego County. I'm Cherokee, and I'm from Los Angeles, born and raised, but my um, ancestors are from Oklahoma, where the Cherokee Nation is. I'm, I'm Navajo, half Navajo, half Salvadorian. So that is um, my little teaser for my short film. My short film is actually completed. Oops, sorry. Um, okay, sorry about that. Um, my short film is completed. It's about 15 minutes. It's just a documentary where I interview these young, um, young adults who have also migrated to the city back in the early 2000s. So it's, like I said, it's a continuation, I feel like, what Kent McKenzie has created. So the Exile film has directly influenced my project, obviously. Um, my project is called Legacy of Exile Indians, which is, is, like I said, a continuation of McKenzie's work. It consists of photography, film, documenting the lives of seven young Native Americans currently living in Los Angeles, California, Shot in the neorealistic visual aesthetics reminiscent to um, Kit McKenzie's 1961 film. And what I did is I want viewers to catch a glimpse into the lives of these young urban Indians living out their hopes and their dreams in the current environment of Los Angeles. And in addition to that, I want people to understand also about the policies created by the US government and understand a little more about relocation and understand how Indians came about living in urban establishments. Oops. So about the name Indians, um, the Indians is a pop, is a native pop, pop culture way of self-identifying ourselves. I saw it in a way of retaking and reclaiming the name that settler co colonials have imposed on us and I use it as a way to respond to that and it redefines and restructures who we are um, as Indians. Um, I saw it, I saw these young kids back in the I think like the early 2000 or the late 90s, I saw them painting this term in this context um, through some graffiti art and I just loved it and I asked them and I they were just so simplistic in explaining it to me they're just like well we're not Indians we're not from India we're Indians so it was like this way of reclaiming and re redefining who we are in this colonial I guess settler colonial structure of society that we live in um, so my project portrays a true to life um, Portrait of American Indians history and understanding of urban Indians from various, tri various tribal communities. My project showcases the beauty, the emotions, the contemporary American Indians living in modern times and attempt to help reframe the negative images perpetu perpetuated in mainstream narratives in media, film, visual art, mascots, and the news.
my mission from this and future project is to re reappropriate and give a more more importantly provide an indigenous voice my seven participants um, are all from various different tribes um, we have heather singer she's from the navajo tribe we have spencer batiz he's from the seminole florida seminole tribe and from the oklahoma um, choctaw tribe and then we have gladys de cam and she's from the ogala, ogala lakota tribe in south dakota and then we also have, um, I think I missed these two, sorry. Um, we also have uh, Courtney Alex. She is from the Navajo tribe in Arizona. We have Vivian Garcia and Tony Moran, who were my couple at that time. Uh, Vivian is from the Cherokee tribe in Oklahoma and um, Tony is Navajo from uh, Arizona. And then we, I really wanted to also add a local California tribal member. So I had um, Kenny Ramos, he, and he's from the Barona Bands of Mission Indians, which is a Southern California tribal nation here. So in my work, I want people to rethink the term Indian, tribal, and Native American. And I want people to critically analyze the psychological and the historical structure of my images and I, I and to know that we are part of Los Angeles history and in a, and we are in a contemporary fabric. Um, you know, I, I really think it's important for us to have participation. So to be invited to share this work, um, I'm very humble and thankful. So thank you for inviting me to do this and to share this work because I think it's it really benefits not just um, your school, but other people and other folks that will see this and really kind of understand a lot more about who we are um, as a Native American people. Am I going backwards? Or, oops. So um, this is uh, what I like to do. I like to replicate photos that are taken from the past into a contemporary way. Um, my participants in my project are paying homage to the attire and while they're bringing a nostalgic feel to a city that is undergoing gentrification once again. I use black and white photography to foreground the nostalgic history of American Indians that is rarely viewed. My images incorporate a little bit of that Edward Curtis style structure and history, but I twist it with a contemporary, contemporary um, visual. These, they represent a versatile counter image um, to the damaging dated images of what um, Edward Curtis has created to the public's um, psyche. So I did that purposely. I like using black and white because I feel like it gives um, placement of who we are in history that has been erased. And I do it also with a narrative because I give placement again to the narrative structure of a story that we've been erased because not many stories have been told about us in the 1950s and 60s and not too many people know about the Indian relocation program. Not too many people know about the relationship we have government to government with the United States and how what sovereignty means. And so I'm giving context and I want and I'm open to and want people to expand on these stories. Um, I'm hope it, hoping it encourages other people to go out and think and, you know, rethink more importantly of, of uh, who we are as Indian people. So, um, also my photos are about a tribute to the first generation of American Indians that were relocated in the 1950s. Um, I, once again, I love the film, The Exiles. I love it because it gives, it gives voice and it gives a contemporary image at that time. And so I, once again, will say I'm re-carrying that um, objectives of what Kent McKinsey was doing with his project. And so here are some more photos. And I took 
some stills from the from the film from 1961 and I replicated them with our um, young natives that are living here in the city and I, I say that they're these are not stereotypical images instead they're photos depicting in a realistic mode the multi um, affiliations the interconnection that tribal people have even in a city today so here is another one. Um, I went to certain locations where the film was um, the original 1961 film that Kent McKenzie did. I went to the relocations downtown and we replicated in those particular spots. Um, one of my favorite was at the Third Street Tunnel. Um, the actress, or the, the woman that was portrayed in um, Ken McKenzie's film, um, Yvonne, is on top and then Courtney is on the bottom and then here is another one with the character um, Homer who was in the film um, was at a liquor store and people always laugh about this they're like where is liquor that's 59 cents <laughs> but it's it's a image still that I took from the photo and then at that same place um, at the Grand Central they used to have a liquor store where um, Spencer took that photo. Unfortunately, they closed that liquor store down, so it's no longer there. Um, I, th I, I have this love-hate relationship with LA because we are continuously changing. And I feel like I captured a time and a place of Los Angeles through this project, just like Kent McKenzie captured a time and place of his film. Now, a lot of the places that I've captured are gone. And it's sad, but um, that's just how Los Angeles is. Um, so to summarize, um, the goal of my project was to create similar neorealistic portraits of what Kent McKinsey captured in the exiles. I want people to understand American Indians without a cliched buckskin vision. And I want them to know that we're still um, here and we still have many stories to share. But more importantly, I want to educate others about how American Indians came to Los Angeles and tell a realistic story about modern Indians transitioning into an urban environment. Um, other stories of other cultures, such as um, Asian, African American, Jewish, Middle East, and even Mexican Americans, all those stories have been told about their migration to urban establishments. Yet, we are rarely seen or heard about the relocation of American Indians um, migrating to cities um, until now. And um, that was one of my main reasons why I wanted to do this project. Um, but as I say, displacement from our native homeland has not caused the Indians to disappear. And I thought that quote, um, when, I, when I did an interview, I think with, um, um, when I first started the project, and I didn't really realize what I had said, but um, the reporter, she's like, I like what you had said is like displacement from our Native homeland has not caused the Indian to disappear. So I like sharing that quote because it is true. We are still here. Um, we may have been um, traveling away from our homeland, but my home is always home. Like I say, you know, as I opened, I acknowledge the Tongva people because it's, this is Tongva land. And I'm a visitor. Um, my homeland is on the Navajo reservation, and that will always be my home. So for the time being, I'm here doing the work that I'm doing here in Los Angeles, but my home will always be the Navajo Nation. Um, so I wanted to share, oops, sorry. So I wanted to share a little bit more about my multimedia work. I also do essays about um, different history of Indians and in different environments. And so I have a slew of other projects I'm working on. Um, I'm also a poet, so I write poetry. And I was really particular 
particularly drawn to this poem that took literally um, my entire soul and made me um, weep about just placement that I've gone through and stories that I've been told and conversations that I've had with my with my grandparents, with my family, with other siblings, with with um, just from other people from tribal nations. So this poem I wrote was called My Once Life. And it's just, um, it, it kind of just talks about everything we've endured as Indian people, as native people, as tribal people. And I have 12 beautiful Native American women that live here in Los Angeles. Um, they read a portion of my poem and I wanted to share that with you. So here it is. Can you hear it? I once lived freely in a time where no law and order was in command. I once lived before a trail of broken treaties was ever muttered in strands. I once lived on land where the word partition was never understood. I once lived when our language was beautiful, spoken every day, and never misunderstood. I once lived when our hair was considered sacred in our general life. I once lived when eagle feathers were the compass of life. I once lived when water was free, sacred, and a gift of life. I once lived with my people in a dwelling that was simple. I once lived without judgment of my brown skin because it was my temple. I once lived with family, cousins, and friends and understood unity. I once lived when relocation was not meant to forget who we are as a community. I once lived before our boarding schools punished us for who we are with the philosophy of to the Indian state of the man. I once lived when alcohol was not in our veins, a bottle, or a beer can. I once lived without the term redskin used as a delusional way of life. I once lived before sterilization was an act of taking lives, leaving spirits wandering. I once lived before USDA approved diabetes when treating our bodies. I once lived without IHS replacing our ceremonial medicine with antibodies. I once lived before white crosses plunged into our souls and our homelands lay scorching nights. I once lived before forts and Fort Sumner corralled us like animal archives. I once lived without cowboys and Indians, where the cowboys played the superhero. I once lived when Indian warriors were known as our true brave hero. I once lived before Hollywood used our native homelands like concession stands. I once lived when blood quantum was not known to drain our identity. I once lived before white settlers believed in the myth of manifest destiny. I once lived without reservation suicides taking young, beautiful spirits, believing it was their fault. I once lived when our land was not tortured, raped, bleeding, and crying, and silence with asphalt. I once lived where our tradition was our religion. Today I live with pride. 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 As a Dakota Indian woman, loving Indian woman, Dakota woman, Navajo woman, Arapaho woman, Paiute woman, Cherokee woman, the Shoshone woman, Navajo woman, Washington woman, Oklahoma woman. I live and exist today. 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 I live and exist today because I remember how I once lived. So that is my poem, and these are the lovely women from various tribes, and we all live here in Los Angeles. Um, so thank you very much. This is um, the conclusion of my presentation. I am open to questions. Um, I have a Medium website that I like to write and dabble um, about stories and give um, context to different um, people living in Indian country. And then Touch Any Photography, you can see more of my photography work. Feel free to follow me on Twitter and feel free to follow me on Instagram. And then that's it. Oops, I'll stop sharing. So open to questions. <laughs>
Hey, um, so we've got guys, if you, um, anyone who's in the audience would like to ask any questions of Pamela, please go ahead and type them in the chat and I will go ahead and read them off to her for her to answer. Um, while we wait for anyone to go ahead and, and put their questions in, I just want to say that last piece was extremely beautiful. Very moving. Uh, very moving, very beautiful. Um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, let's see. Anyone have any questions? Oh, okay, here we go. Um, here's one from Jessica. Can you speak about your process of your filmmaking and do you script the films? Um, well, I do, I have written a few scripts. Um, I am periodically hired, um, I'm very selective of being hired as a um, script consultant. Um, but with my own work, I do script my, my, um, my stories, but my documentary, I don't. I just do a shot sheet of like, okay, this is the interview. These are the questions I'm gonna ask. And then I'm just gonna have um, my participants answer how they feel is necessary. And so when I gather all of that up, um, I work with my editor and then we create a timeline of like how we're going to structure it. So it's, it's a little different with documentary, um, um, nonfiction versus fiction. Um, fiction, you know, I've written scripts with a lot of storytelling. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. Thank you. Um, next question is from Angelica. Um, how did you find and connect with the women in your last short film? Oh, in the, um, the video poem? Yes. They're all, they're all women that I know in Los Angeles. Um, I've lived in Los Angeles um, since the late 80s, early 90s. Um, lived briefly in New York City in the early 90s. But um, I've just established relationships with the Native American community in Los Angeles. If you're Native, you, you, find, you find your relatives, you find your relations, and that's what I did. Um, I came out to Los Angeles not knowing many Natives, um, and I went to the Indian Center because I was looking for a job, and then I got connected, and then I got invited, to people's homes, if I needed a place to stay, if I was hungry, I was very young. And so, you know, I took people's, people up on their offers and that's kind of how people just got to know me. And then later I worked at the Indian Center, um, helped set up their annual powwows, their Indian picnics that we would have every year, you know, the gatherings and so, um, I just knew a lot of people. There's actually a large community of Native Americans here in Los Angeles, but we tend to find each other, just like any other culture. Like you have the Armenian community, they all know each other, and you have, you know, the um, Persian, they all know where to go, and, you know, the Japanese, there's little Tokyo, but we don't have a community like that, and um, it's unfortunate, but I think it's also because we are we're so different that we have different tribes and um but we we as indian people we connect and we we know each other like oh you know if you're from the reservation you know when you meet other people from the reservation you pretty much know um so that's kind of how i connected and that's how i met everybody so yeah okay thank you um Let's see, next question is, I understand your reason for using, oh, this is from Maya, sorry. I understand your reason for using black and white, but is there an instance when you would consider using color in any of your future work? Oh, um, I do a lot of color. If you go to my webpage, that's all you'll see, basically. Um, for my essay work, um, I 
the two the two projects that I've done, um, Legacy of Exile Indians and Real Indians Take Retake Hollywood, I did those both in black and white um, because I wanted to give time and place um, to those two particular stories because they're um, structured with um, placement in the 1950s and 60s. So those two I I deliberately did in black and white um, to give that nostalgic um, context to them. But most of the work that I do today um, is, is actually in black and white. Like um, I did a response to Edward Curtis's films where I did them in um, uh, a kind of a little uh, sepatone, um, sepia. Yeah, in a sepia tone. And then, um, I've taken photos of some of the tribal members here in Los Angeles, from the Chumash, the Tatavian, um, the Tongva, uh, Kawia tribes, and they have all been done in color. And when I get hired to um, document or help tribal um, communities with their, their events, um, I usually provide them in color. So, yes. Thank you. Um, all right, do we have any other questions? Those were my only three so far. Let's go. I think I'm unmuted, right? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I was just gonna ask Pamela, um, is there still a large, it's not, it seemed like the people that you put in your films were, you, I think you said that they were recent migrants to Los Angeles, that they weren't children of, of people from the original relocation? With uh, the exception of Vicky. Vicky was like a second generation, is second there, or third. Okay. Is there, is there still a large migration of people, of Native Americans coming into Los Angeles? And is, I was wondering if you could talk about the complexities of that and whether this, there is still, whether young people are still moving to cities and if there's a fear that of a continuation of the culture on the, on the original homelands and if kind of, if there's a complex relationship with that today. Um, I definitely think there, there is a large um, migration of young, young adults that are coming to the cities. Um, a lot of them are actually moving to community to to metropolitan cities that are near their reservations and i'm only speaking from experience from what i've seen um and here um but i've met quite a few young um people that have come from different reservations from like you'll see in my next project um i do have this young couple that moved from the crow um, Crow Reservation, and they had lived in um, New Mexico for a little bit, and then they came to Los Angeles, and they've been out here for about, I think, now six years, but it's because of the work they're trying to um, break into. One's a, a writer, and the other one, um, she's an actress, and so they came out here for a purpose, and I think a lot of them do come out here for a purpose. I, however, didn't come out to LA with a purpose. <laughs> I wanted to leave the reservation. Um, I was a young, you know, rebellious teenager. And I was just like, yeah, man, this is too boring for me. I need, I need to leave and I want to follow the rock, rock stars. And so that's what brought me to LA was the music scene. So that's what brought me out here. But I see a lot of young adults, um, they come out here for a purpose. And um, yeah, there, there's quite a few. Most of them I've, I've met have come out here for, for, for school. There's a lot of universities out here. Um, I, I don't, I think the recruiting, a lot of universities like UCLA and USC and the Cal State systems, they have a lot of Native American um, recruitments. And so they go out to a lot of tribal reservations and they recruit them. And, you know, Southern California is a great place to get an education. And so um, I noticed a lot of young kids from different tribal reservations, from 
the Northern Plains, from um, the Southwest, from the East Coast, um, I think the majority of them have come out here for, for educational purposes, but also to break into the, the um, film industry. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, let's see, I don't, I don't see any other questions. I want to give everyone just one more moment in case anyone has something they'd like to ask. Um, let's see, Jessica, do you have anything additional? Um, no, I mean, I just encourage people to ask questions if they have them. Um, but, but I just want to say thank you, Pamela, for, for a really interesting and talk and for agreeing to show your work in the, in the exhibition. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I can talk a little bit about, um, I, you know, I talk about the, the influence I had from the film, um, The Exiles, and I hope you can go out and search for it. It is available. But I saw the, the restoration of the film back in 2007 um, at UCLA, and I was, you know, studying film, and I pondered of doing my work for five years. And I want people to understand these projects don't just like, oh, boom, I'm gonna do it. It takes a while. So 2007 is when I saw the film. I got a job downtown um, in 2010, working on the historical core and the building I was in was on Bunker Hill. So we were on the 23rd floor and every afternoon I would look out and I would see beautiful downtown and I would think I need to do this project. So I would take a walk every day, look at all the places of where Kent McKenzie filmed. And then just one day it was like, I have to do this. By God, I'm going to do this. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it. So I was working on a um, web series with a friend of mine and, and she told me you should do it. You know, I did the web series through uh, GoFundMe. I was like, what is GoFundMe? And she told me, she's like, well, you can go out and ask, you know, people to help you fund your project. And I was like, I don't know if I can do that. Well, people, you know, give to my project. She was all, I'll help you out. So her boyfriend, or actually her husband at the time, he was a photographer, well-established professional photographer. And she was um, an inspiring actress. Um, she was native and she told her, her um, husband who it was white and he's like, oh my God, I love it. You should do it. It needs to be done. I will even help you. And I was like, okay. So <laughs> she helped me write a little bit about it and she shared it. And so she just told me, this is how you do, you know, fundraising. So I did, and I raised um, a good like $1,500 to start out. I had no camera. I was like, how am I going to do this if I don't have a camera? So I put out a, I looked on Craigslist, got a, um, rented a camera from this guy he charged me 50 bucks a day and um, my friends, her husband, he let me use his lens, um, got a little small crew, we went out and, but then I was like, I'm not sure how many people will want to participate. So when I get, went out to these young adults and I said, hey, listen, I'm doing this project. They said, I'm in, I'll do it. And then I had a friend, she, became like my stylist. Um, she's an older woman that I knew when I was taking photography courses um, here at Santa Monica College. Um, she went out and bought a lot of my um, costumes um, from that era because she grew up in that era. And so I had a little crew together and it, it just happened. And I was literally blown away by looking at all my images. I still have like probably three or 400 images that I wish I could, you know, share because I was just like, got to capture this, got to capture this, got to capture this. This is just an amazing moment. So if you have a desire to do stories, if you have a desire to, you know, want to pursue um, 
the arts, you, you just, you, it's possible. You can do it. You can actually do it without the equipment. It's just a matter of, you know, if the passion is there. And my passion for telling our stories was there. And I think I had these little steps of guidance, like the movie where I was working, you know, the people I was connecting with. It just all was like signs to tell me this is what you need to do. And I totally believe that. And right now I have a sign of a project I'm working on that's kind of guiding me too. Um, so I just wanted to share that little nitbit because everyone's like, oh, well, I don't have a camera. I wish I could do that. I'm like, well, I didn't have a camera either, but I did it. So anything is possible. Do you mind sharing a little bit about the, uh, the piece that your work or the project you're working on now that you feel has that same kind of sign drawing you on? Yes. Yeah, so I'm always inspired by other artists. I have a lot of artist friends and they're always sharing um, their artwork with me. And my friend, she's a, she's Tongva and she did, um, she's documenting her, her Tongva um, origins here in Los Angeles. And so she did this whole photography, beautiful photography project about the origins of her Tongva um, people of the land base here in Los Angeles. And she has, her grandparents live in Malibu. So she's documented um, the, 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 the whole structure of Malibu and this beautiful storytelling. And she has this display um, of these different rocks and, and forms and how they all interconnect and how it connects to her being as a Tongva woman in Los Angeles. So one day we were talking about it and I'm like, you know, I really want to do something like that with my tribe, about my family. And um, those stories that are in my family are with my mom right now and my, my aunt and my uncle. And I remember as a child, taking these trips where my grandmother would tell me stories and tell me the importance of these different places and the whole structures of different um, like mesas and the stories behind them and how these rock formations have stories and they have people that are intertwined with them um, because she would always tell me everything ha is a living being everything is a relative and I forgot all about that. And I think with my discussion with my friend um, Mercedes, she brought that all out. And so I called her one day, we talked for like two hours on the phone about two months ago. And I said, you really made me, you've inspired me and you've really made me think about the origins of my existence too. So that's my next project is the origins of my existence as a Navajo woman and how I came about and the trails that I've taken and to remember the land of where I'm at on, on the Navajo Nation and how that transitioned me to LA, but then it's also forcing me back home. So that explains a little bit about it. I know it's a little too much, but. Um, no, it's, it's wonderful. Um, thank you. And I think it's, it's um, great for anyone listening to, to ex experience through your lecture and, and your discussion, um, sort of the process of, of how you're getting to the ideas and where you're drawing inspiration from. Um, it's, it's just wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, can I just explain one more um, inspiration with my legacy, um, the Real Indians Retake Hollywood. Um, it's also a nostalgic um, photo essay about our placement of Native American actors in the place of Hollywood films. And so I've had these actors, young actors, and I have them portrayed as iconic, classic um, Hollywood icons like Elvis Presley, Audrey Hepburn, you know, um, um, Eartha, Eartha Kitt. So they're embodying these iconic images from that time and they're actors. And I did that and I say retake because it's retaking um, what history has 
um, dismiss us in our stories of Hollywood films. And it's replacing us in this dignified and beautiful um, way of understanding Native American actors instead of seeing them in these period pieces and being typecast into, you know, as relic Indians. And so I wanted to show that. But the images behind that was inspired by George Hurl. And I'm a huge fan of Hollywood classic photography. And I love, I have tons of books of George Hurl's um, photography, book, um, photography in some books that I've purchased. But I would just look through those pages and pages and I was just like, God, it would be remarkable to see a contemporary native actor seen as like a Audrey Hepburn or a James Dean or, you know, a Bonnie and Clyde. Why can't we see that? And so that's kind of what inspired me to do that particular project as well. And that's on my website if people want to see it. Well, I definitely encourage um, anyone uh, to, you know, to go ahead and view um, your work for more information and to see more of what you've been doing. Um, I think at this point, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, end our discussion for today. Um, but I want to thank you again so much for participating in the online exhibition and uh, doing this wonderful uh, guest lecture for us. And um, on that Absolutely. note, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we very much appreciate it. And uh, for being our, I guess you could say our, our capstone for the series because you were our last one. So um, this will be amazing. And um, we will be uploading recorded um, sessions of these on the website and on our YouTube channel. Um, so anyone who couldn't make it today can go ahead and, and watch in the future. Um, but I think on that note, I'm just gonna wish everyone a good rest of your day. And um, thank you again for coming. Well, thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Uh -huh.